Yeah, so let's talk about diabetes teaching today. Um, so there's a lot of teaching for diabetes. I'm going to help to skim over some of it and hopefully kind of get you a basic idea of some of that really key teaching that we want to give to a diabetic patient. Um, so first and foremost, they need to understand what makes diabetes better. And two of the most crucial things for diabetes are going to, um, you know, the kind of the, I would say the three trifecta things that are going to help diabetes are diet, exercise, and medications. Um, now, some people aren't going to need medication and some people, they may already have a good diet or some exercise. It's working well for them. But as a whole, those are like the three things that are really like help bring together diabetes and manage it well. Um, so what I need to teach the patient about their diet, it's going to be individualized depending on the client. We usually do what's called a carbohydrate controlled diet or, um, you know, we're managing how many carbohydrates the patient is taking in. Um, and we also want to consider that with their diet, we usually want to, well, we always want to support heart health because um, diabetes and cardiovascular health are really closely connected. Um, and so in other words, I want to make sure that on top of them being on a carbohydrate controlled diet, that I want to watch the amount of fat that they're intaking. Because even if I manage their blood glucose, this patient is at such higher risk for cardiovascular complications. So I really want to start by um, treating not just the diabetes, but treating the complications too. Um, exercise wise, I want to make sure that they know to check their blood glucose prior. They should not exercise if their blood glucose, glu uh, blood glucose is less than hundred because that means it would be too low to safely exercise. Because when I exercise, I'm gonna use my stores of glucose. Um, and so I could end up having a really, really bad hypoglycemia if my blood glucose is not um, high enough. For type one diabetics though, I wanna make sure they're not dehydrated. So a type one diabetic should not exercise if their blood glucose is too high like greater than 250 and if there's ketone pres ketones present. And they can do a urine test at home to see if um, the ketones are present. So in other words, they should know to check their gl blood glucose before. Um, do not exercise if their blood glucose is less than 100. And if they're type 1, they should not exercise um, if their blood glucose is too high and they have ketones in their urine. I also want to teach them in general about their medications. They need to know when to take them, um, whether it involves they need to take them with the first bite of the meal, they should only take them if they're eating, um, you know, whether they um, need to take them with certain types of foods or avoid certain foods when they take them, um, whatever it might be, they need to know when. They also need to know how to take them. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about this on a uh, different slide. And you can also look over the insulin PowerPoint as well, but you know, there's a certain um, way to administer insulin. And there's some of these medications that have a special administration, et cetera. Uh, <clears throat> so we always wanna make sure that patients know how to um, take their medications appropriately. They also need to know the side effects or the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. All medications for diabetes are going to have a side effect of hypoglycemia. So they need to know what that feels like, that cold and clammy, give me candy, that shaky, diaphoretic, heart racing, irritable, hungry, um, you know, um, kind of uh, signs and symptoms that may come with their medications. They should always carry a snack on them in case of hypoglycemia, and they should know that while they're taking their medications, they're going to need to check their blood glucose regularly. You'd be surprised how many people that come into the hospital that you'll ask them how often they check their blood glucose at home, and many of them say, oh no, I just take my medicine, um, and they don't really ever know what their blood glucose is. They also need to know how to monitor their diabetes on a daily basis. So at home, they're gonna do glucometer testing. Um, <clears throat> they need to know how to check their blood glucose um, to keep their hands warm, um, not to milk that finger. Um, if they're having trouble getting blood, they can hang their arm dependent, which means hanging down. Um, if you work in a hospital and you always do it with the finger up and that works, that's fine. But um, sometimes um, anytime you link something dependent, blood rushes down and helps to flow to that finger if you're having trouble getting blood out. And you want to use the side of the finger. The middle of the finger, the pad of the finger actually has a lot of nerves on it. Um, and that can cause damage to those nerves and uh, weight cut. You also usually have better luck getting from the sides of the fingers. With some of these patients, it is hard to find a spot to check a blood glucose on their fingers. So sometimes you have to get creative, but you do want to teach them these basic tricks. You want to tell them when to check their blood glucose. So they should always check their blood glucose prior to taking medicines. They may need to check their blood glucose during the peak of their medications. Um, they may need to monitor it when they're, um, they're obviously going to need to monitor if they're sick before they exercise, you know, some of the other things that we've already talked about. 
but it's important for them to know when, because maybe even if they know how to check it, if they don't know when they're supposed to check it, um, they may end up um, having a complication because they just didn't know when to check it. They also need to know when to get help. And we're going to talk about what some of those signs and symptoms are later. But after they get their reading, even if they do it correctly, do they know what's a high number? What's a low number? And you can go to the all about the numbers diabetes thing to kind of learn more about those numbers. Um, uh, that's another video that I did. Um, <clears throat> but patients need to be educated on what's a normal blood glucose. When is it low that I need to seek help? If it gets low, what do I do? If it gets high, what do I do? When do I need to come in? When do I need to call? So these are really important things for diabetics to know. They also need to know about other monitoring um, <clears throat> with, their, uh, with their diabetes, other testing they might need done. So they're gonna have regular eye examinations um, to look for the diabetic retinopathy, cataracts, glaucoma, and other things that they're at higher risk for. <laughs> Um, regular cardiovascular health labs, like checking a lipid panel, regular blood pressure checks for hypertension and things like that. It, um, because remember, diabetes and heart disease are really closely linked. Um, so we're always going to need to keep an eye on that cardiovascular health for diabetic patients. Additionally, regular dental checks and cleanings are going to be needed. Um, patients are going to be really at high risk for dental complications, and that all relates to heart health, too. So we need to encourage regular dental checkups and regular cleanings as well. Um, they're also going to need to regularly, when they go to their doctor, get their hemoglobin A1C checked. And if you watch my other video on um, diabetes down to the numbers, it talks about how, like, this is the lab that you can't cheat that really tells how's your blood glucose been over time, like over two to three months. So they should have that regularly checked. And, um, excuse me, sorry. Too many videos, too little time. Um, the reason that it needs to have it checked is not just to see, are they really managing their blood glucose? Well, how are they eating? But even if they're eating well, taking their medications, their hemoglobin A1C may still be high because maybe they have an insulin resistance issue. So that's going to help to better uh, the doctor to better give them the medications and treatment that they need. So it kind of tells the doctor, how are they doing with the medications and the diet and whatever else they're on right now? So it's a great to kind of get a regular check. And, you know, these are usually done every three to six months. And then also to look for kidney problems, we're going to do regular urine albumin testing. So like I mentioned, they also need to know signs of a problem. So they should know those signs of hypo and hyperglycemia. So remember hypo, cold and clammy, give me candy, hungry, irritable, tired, diaphoretic, heart racing. You know, I'm hungry, so my body is stimulating my sympathetic nervous system. And then hyperglycemia is hot and dry. They're eating a lot, drinking a lot, peeing a lot. So that polyuria, um, polydipsia, polyphagia um, that they're going to have. And then they're checking their blood glucose, and it's usually greater than 200, 250. <coughs> Excuse me. And then that low blood glucose is usually less than 70. So we also want to give them foot care teaching. So remember, they can have... Um, you know, extremity complications where they don't um, feel or, um, you know, have, they have um, diabetic neuropathy or they don't feel their feet or they may have numbness and tingling, um, but they're, <clears throat> all diabetics are at high risk uh, for having uh, foot problems and having foot complications. So because of this, we always want to have them. Um, so they should have, uh, they should be checking their feet every day um, and they should be examining it, not just the tops of their feet, but especially the bottoms of their feet, um, you know, uh, in between their toes, on their heels um, and stuff like that. And if they can't do that, they need someone else to check that for them every day. Um, Well-fitted shoes are key, uh, making sure that their shoes are comfortable and that they're not too loose, not too tight. Um, and, um, you know, we're going to help support them so that there's no rubbing or um, breakdown to the skin from that. Um, they should also avoid damage to their feet. They avoid things that are too hot or too cold that could cause damage. Because remember, again, they cannot feel that damage that's happening. They should never be allowed to be barefoot because being barefoot for them puts them at high risk for injury. Again, they can cut themselves because they can't feel stuff. So just because they don't feel it doesn't mean it's not causing damage. Um, Lotion to the feet and moisturizing the feet is super important, but they shouldn't put it between the toes because between toes, the bacteria can grow. So they always should avoid um, putting that lotion between their toes, just on their feet itself. 
and they should regularly clip their nails, but when they do, they should cut them straight across. And you'll see a lot of diabetic patients, they're, um, they're recommended to go to a podiatrist to have them clip their nails because there's such a risk that they could cut it the wrong way and um, cause bleeding or infection or breakdown. And so a lot of times these patients, it's just not even safe for them to do it themselves. But if they are gonna do it, they need to clip, clip their nails straight across. There's also sick day education that we can give to these patients. So if a patient's sick and if they're on insulin, we want to tell them while they're sick, don't stop taking it, even if they're not eating. So most people, like if they're not eating, they're like, oh, I'm not going to take my medication. But when it comes to insulin, you want to still take it. Because if I'm a type 1 diabetic, I'm on insulin, I'm sick. Um, you know, even though it seems like, oh, hey, I'm sick, I'm not eating, my blood glucose is going to be low. Keep in mind when you're sick, your blood glucose actually goes up. Like if I'm fighting an infection or something like that, my body's like, I need more glucose. So it sends more glucose to the rescue. Um, and so it makes more glucose in order and releases more glucose in order to help fight whatever I'm fighting. So I should still keep taking my insulin because this is how a lot of people end up in crisis, uh, like DKA is they'll come in, they were like, oh, I was sick. So I stopped taking my insulin and they ended up in DKA because of that because their blood glucose went really high and then they weren't drinking anything so they got dehydrated. Um, so as a whole if they're on insulin um, they should keep taking it even if they're not eating but at the same time they should be checking their blood glucose every four hours and making sure that it's staying stable and like I said dehydration is a big part of being sick so make sure they're drinking lots of water to prevent that dehydration. Um, and they should seek help because, um, you know, a lot of stuff like a cold for me is going to be very different than a cold for a diabetic. So um, I remember one time when I was working um, and helping out in the emergency room one day, and there was this guy that came in, he was real young, he was younger than I was, like early 20s, new onset of diabetes, and he had like, he had like a little um, abscess on his stomach, like real small, and they popped it and drained it and everything. And if he was a normal guy, they would have sent him home right away. But because he was diabetic, he had to stay in the hospital for two days because there's such a high risk of complication and infection because these people don't heal. So it's not to say that every time a diabetic sick, they have to go into the hospital and stay for a few days. But if they're not getting better um, after a day or two, they really should consult their doctor. And um, especially if they're not able to eat, keep things down or drink water, they need to go seek help. Because if they're not able to even keep water in, they're gonna end up dehydrated and they can end up in that really crisis state like the HHS, the DKA. Um, so hydration, regular glucose checks and keep taking your insulin. Now, when it comes to the oral medication, that's a little different. A lot of those oral medications, they only work if you're eating. So you can't take them if you're not eating. And also a lot of them only work if you're getting carbs in. And so if you're not eating carbs, it's not gonna really help. So with those medications, most of the time, um, they're not going to take them. They're also less predictable because we're, we're eating, uh, we're not eating them, but we're swallowing them orally. Um, and so we're not going to be able to predict as much how they're going to work in our body as insulin. Like insulin has times. If I inject this insulin into my stomach, this is how long it's going to work. And so, um, you know, whereas it comes with the oral medications, they can last more long term and can lead to a lot of complications. So they should always call their doctor. But, you know, a lot of times when patients are sick, they're not going to still take some of their medications that are the oral medications, but they should always take their insulin. <clears throat> So general teaching, like we talked about, always have a snack on hand. So they should have like a fast sugar, like a um, like we talked about, like orange juice, um, actual candy, sugar, glucose tab, something like that, um, in order to like really help um, to get that blood glucose up. And it's great if they can have a protein snack too. So if they can have like some peanut butter crackers on them, um, you know, keep them um, like uh, bring like if they're going on like a little trip somewhere, maybe like bringing like a turkey sandwich with them or something, something that has protein and fat to help keep their blood glucose stable over time. If they're having an acute hypoglycemic episode, they need to use something fast. But um, if they're just trying to stabilize their blood glucose over time, like after they take that fast sugar, or if they're just kind of like starting to trend down, then we want something that has protein and fat in it. Um, we also want to teach them good hygiene practices. So these patients are going to need to learn about how to care for themselves, not just their teeth, um, their skin, um, you know, the general um, like perineal hygiene, wiping from front to back and other things to avoid infection. Um, but as a whole, like hand washing, avoiding crowds or people that are sick, things like that as well.
And then immunizations are key for these patients too. They're so high risk to get infections. So like with this whole COVID thing that's been going on, patients that are diabetic have gotten sicker with COVID than others many times um, because of their susceptibility. Like one of the things about having diabetes is you don't have the same immune defense. Like kind of the, the way I always like to describe it is it's kind of like if I had, um, uh, diabetes and uh, so if I didn't have diabetes and I got an infection my body's like ha ah, I'm coming to the rescue I'm gonna save the day whereas like um you know people with diabetes their immune system's like oh hey guys I think there's something going on over there we should go check it out all right let's take lunch first you know <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> just a little joke they're not actually doing that but like it takes longer for your immune system to come help in diabetes. Um, and then the help that it gives is not as strong or as much as it is in a person without diabetes. Um, so as a whole, immunizations can really make all the difference for these patients. And that's not just for COVID, that's flu, um, pneumonia vaccine and stuff like that as well. So hopefully this gave you a good idea of where to get started with how to teach patients with diabetes and what education is key for them. I hope this video was helpful. Catch you next time.